Um, our speaker today is going to be Professor Michael Murray of Franklin and Marshall College. Uh, Mike received his BA from Franklin and Marshall and earned his PhD in philosophy here at Notre Dame. He's the uh, editor or co-editor of several books, author of uh, many articles, um, recognized as a leading scholar in uh, Leibniz in philosophy of religion, um, and has also been a leading figure in recent years in the Society of Christian Philosophers. Uh, let me mention that at the end of Mike's talk, he will be open for comments and questions, and he will feel those himself, recognize questioners himself. And after the uh, lecture and discussion period ends at about 5.30, we will have refreshments outside here as well. So please do plan on staying for those. Um, the title of Mike's paper um, is the longest in the history of the planning a fellow lectureship. Now, this is only the second year of the planning a fellow lectureship, but nevertheless, a truth is a truth, and so I thought it was worth pointing that out to you. Um, Mike, no doubt, will be sharing with us many other truths of greater interest and more importance in the course of the talk. Uh, the title of Mike's talk is God and Darwin's Clumsy, Wasteful, Blundering, Low, and Horribly Cruel Works of Nature. Please join me in welcoming Professor Murray. Well, I hope that uh, all of you read the poster carefully before you decided to come. I suspected that some people might, hear, might be here thinking that they were going to hear the fellow Alvin Plantinga give a talk, but instead uh, you have the, the Alvin planning a fellow. Uh, that's me, so this is your last chance for a graceful exit before things get underway. Uh, if you don't have a handout, there are still some over here by the door. You might want to pick one up, um, and we'll begin. When I was 11 years old, I was accompanied by my family on a long weekend getaway to a resort in the Catskills. Late one afternoon, after we'd tired of swimming and playing shuffleboard, my parents took us to a small rundown zoo. Many of the animals in this unique zoo were left to roam about the property, perching themselves on walkside benches or on mud paths that cut between the cracked and frost-heaved sidewalks. Many of the animals were asleep, their stomachs full of all manner of tidbits that zoo visitors had offered them to eat. But of course, not all of the animals were left to roam free, uh, and this was a good thing. Uh, no one had any interest in rounding the corner and finding a tiger laying on a park bench. And so the tigers were confined to a small square jail cell with a concrete floor and two stainless steel bowls in the corner for food and water. Each tiger would pace back and forth like a pendulum, their huge soft paws wearing a groove in the otherwise unforgiving floor. I remember thinking, as surely we all have when we've seen animals in such conditions, how sad it was that these poor beautiful creatures couldn't roam gracefully across their natural environment the way they do in those slow motion National Geographic film clips. Of course, only the most saccharine sentimentalist can remain in the grip of this thought for very long. As difficult as the tiger's plight might be in confinement, the natural environment is barely more merciful than these artificial ones. Most animals in their natural state are born precariously, live in perpetual danger, and die horrible deaths. Uh, while we all recoil from the sight of human cruelties inflicted on animals, we recoil no less from many sights in the wild, from parasites and disease and death, from sick whales beaching themselves by the hundreds, zebras being dragged down by lions, and seal pups crushed in the jaws of orcas. As Theodore Roosevelt observed, death by violence, death by cold, death by starvation, these are the normal endings of stately and beautiful creatures of the wilderness. The sentimentalists who prattle about the peaceful life of nature don't realize its utter mercilessness. The plight of animals in the natural world has been of persistent, if not always frequent, concern of Christians, and throughout the history of Christian thought, most argued that this plight was to be explained as a consequence of or a punishment for the fall. Yet in the 19th century, as Christians began to grapple with the evidence that animals pre-existed humans, these explanations rang hollow. And with the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859, such concerns only intensified. While most Christians had, at that point, made peace with an understanding of creation that required a less than fully literal reading of Genesis, the claim that organismic complexity and diversity was best explained by appeal to phenotypic variation and natural selection was a theological bombshell, not only to Darwin's readers, but to Darwin himself. 
Not only did Darwinism embrace the notion that animals, with all of their predation, pain, and death, preexisted human beings, but predation, pain, and death were now claimed to be the very instruments of creation. It thus appeared that the structure of the created order itself included a mechanism of creation which was fraught with evil right to its very core. Consequently, in the half century after the publication of The Origin, Christian apologists who adopted the evolutionary account of biological origins were forced to grapple with how to explain the pervasiveness of animal suffering and death required by Darwin's view. As Darwin himself explained the problem, quote, the sufferings of millions of the lower animals throughout almost endless time uh, is apparently irreconcilable with the existence of a creator of unbounded goodness. Such sentiments led Darwin to utter his famous quip, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horribly cruel works of nature. Many Christian thinkers of the period attempted to make peace with the deliverances of the Darwinian picture by pointing out those facets of Darwinian evolution that seemed rather more indicative of providential wisdom, power, or concern. For example, many pointed out that despite its unpalatable byproducts, the biological world was created in such a way that it was capable of producing creatures which were progressively more conformed to the image of the creator, culminating with the appearance of human beings themselves. Still others saw the creation of living things by means of uh, the natural law of variation and selection, as they called it, as the testimony to the wisdom of the creator, in much the way the machines used in industrial production testify to the wisdom of their designers. The popular 19th century preacher Henry Ward Beecher noted in an 1885 sermon that while looking at an oriental rug at a rug factory, we might remark, and this is the first quote on the handout, well, that's a beautiful design, and these are skillful women that made it. There can be no question about that. But now behold the power loom, where not simply a rug with long, drudging work by hand is being created, but where the machine is creating carpet in endless lengths. Now the question is this. Is it an evidence of design in these women that they turn out such work? And is it not evidence of a higher design in the man who turned out that machine, which could carry on this work a thousandfold more magnificently than human fingers did? As Beecher summed up the underlying sentiment, design by wholesale is grander than design by retail. Wealthy industrialists who filled the pews of Beecher's Brooklyn church were surely nodding their heads at his insightful, if somewhat sexist, remarks. But other found, others found this line of reasoning to be profoundly unsatisfying. For as insightful as these attempts at explanation might have been, they failed to explain why an evolutionary process must be attended by the evident horrors it contains. It was failure of this sort that led Boston University philosopher Borden Bound to exclaim in frustration, this is I think the second quote on the handout, if evolution's the law of life, of course, the present must seem imperfect relative to the future and the past imperfect relative to the present, but this doesn't meet the question of why this progress might not have been accomplished at less cost of toil and struggle and pain. In truth, it's only another way of saying that the system is to be judged good only in its outcome, and the outcome is assumed to be good. The fact that evolution in any way diminishes the creator's responsibility for evil is really somewhat infantile. Why might not pain have been dispensed with as a means? Why might not everything have been made perfect at once? Things may be as good as possible, but if there's an omnipotent goodness at the root of things, why aren't they better? Such considerations led many to conclude in Beecher's words that God's purposes in nature lay beyond our ken, and that neither in nature nor in providence are his ways like our ways. The issue of animal suffering and divine goodness has received strikingly little attention in recent Christian philosophy. This is surprising for a variety of reasons. First, the course of evolutionary theory over the last hundred years or so has made some of the halting attempts to explain animal suffering even harder to defend. The notion that variation in natural selection is an inevitable tool for securing biological progress has long fallen out of favor, for example. And the notion that evolutionary development has any teleological character at all is little defended. Furthermore, contemporary critics of theism have made some notable appeals to animal suffering as a way of pressing the argument for atheism that springs from, from evil. In the most widely discussed argument for atheism from evil, William Rowe presents as his centerpiece example the image of a deer burned in a forest fire, dying slowly and in great pain alone in the woods. What kind of God, he asks, could possibly permit preventable suffering in an animal that lacks moral responsibility if the suffering serves no purpose? Part of the reason for the lack of attention to the topic is a general lack of enthusiasm for the project of theodicy among contemporary Christian philosophers. This lack of enthusiasm springs from two distinct sources. Both of these sources are associated with a position that's come to be called skeptical theism. So let me say something briefly about skeptical theism 
and the two ways in which it gives rise to disinterest in theodicy. On the one hand, skeptical theists don't see any pressing need to engage in the project of theodicy. Traditionally, theodicy construction went on with an eye to defanging various arguments which employ evil as evidence for atheism. Most Christian philosophers now think these evidential arguments from evil are fundamentally flawed in a way that obviates the need for theodicy. In brief, these evidential arguments typically suppose that since we're aware of a number of evils which, as far as we can tell, aren't necessary conditions for any greater goods at all, it's more reasonable for us to assume, assume that they don't thereby contribute to securing greater goods. Evils of this sort are thus gratuitous. Skeptical theists have argued successfully, I believe, that arguments of this sort are suspect and should be rejected. They're suspect because they rely on the supposition that since one doesn't see any greater goods that the evils in question are meant to bring about, that there are no such goods. These so-called no see em inferences, so-called because they rely on this inference that if I don't see them, they ain't there, are notoriously fallacious. No doubt reasoning of this sort sometimes works. When I conclude there's no car in the garage because I looked in the garage and I didn't see one, the inference seems respectable enough. But we can imagine still other cases. For example, a case in which a doctor wants to give you a shot. Before he injects you, he drops the unprotected needle on the floor and proceeds to pick it up and is about to inject you and you say, uh, doctor, I think that needle might be dirty. There might be germs on it. The doctor stares intently at the needle and says, uh, I've looked very closely and I don't see any germs. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. Well, this doctor's made a noceum inference and it's a bad one. Why? Because even if the germs were there, he wouldn't see them. His not seeing them just is no evidence that they aren't in fact there. Skeptical theists invite us to consider whether the noceum inference employed in the evidential argument for atheism is more like the garage case or the doctor case. And the answer is clear. It's more like the doctor case. Even if there were good reasons for some instance or type of evil, there's just no good reason to think we would be aware of it. And thus, our not seeing the reason tells us very little that's of value. As a result, this sort of argument provides the theist with little motivation to start constructing theodicies or other explanations for evil. Doing so is just more than the argument demands. 